Welcome to Unlearning Ignorance, a podcast where once a month we discuss a commonly divisive issue and attempt to fairly represent multiple perspectives. We are not experts, nor are we neutral. Our goal is to show an accurate understanding of conflicting sides in hopes that it will foster civil conversations with an attitude of always learning. But we also want the show to represent you. So every month we will have a response episode where we highlight your comments, emails, tweets, and voicemails telling us what we got terribly right, incredibly wrong, or something in between. Thanks for listening to this month's episode where we bring together Vox Populi, the voice of the people. Welcome to the Unlearning Ignorance Podcast. What's up, Ethan? What up, Chase? What have you been unlearning lately? <laughs> <laughs> been unlearning a lot. Unlearning a lot about music and people's perspectives on how yeah. they view it and subjectivity. I feel like I've been unlearning how to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> unlearning how to keep a reasonable life schedule. Unlearning how to do the things at work that I need to get done. No, you learned it very well last week to get it all done in as as yeah. small time as possible. Yeah, but by working four of my vacation days. Um, yeah, no, this is good. Uh, we are recording uh, one of the few times we actually get to do episodes in person. <sighs> which in is the flesh. Fun. Yeah. I don't know what it's going to be like staring into your eyes. It'll make editing easier. I can tell you that. You're welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, so this month, for unlearning ignorance, we are discussing on uh, as we flip flop between more political leaning issues and more kind of social, you could say populist leaning issues. Um, no, no, the no. populist is definitely a political <laughs> thing too. That's a. Uh, I enjoyed the irony of that. Uh, we are discussing objectivity within music. Yes, we are. Which is a is a bad music topic. Um, <laughs> what? It's a bad music topic. Yeah, it's like, bad music. Oh, do, um, do people make bad music about objectivity? Yeah, 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 yeah. In music, um, huh. I I specifically try to write bad songs to prove that songs can be bad. Is that is that a thing? Was that what ours by accident? Oh, thanks. Oh, oh, oh thanks. Oh, That's oh, a good. You might want to cut that out. No, it's oh. fine. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I'm not using that stage name anymore. We can talk trash about it. I that band is dead to me. I was thinking <laughs> earlier uh, in in the planning of this episode, why just music? You know, why aren't we talking about objectivity in arts as a whole? And the conclusion I came to, and I'd be interested if you have a different thought on this, is that each different art form seems to come with its own. Uh, standards of what makes it quote unquote good or not, what makes it bad or not. And, you know, when you look at something like film, you literally have rules that you can't break. You know, you, you actually have like good sound editing, you know, you actually have, you know, proper camera angles so that a viewer is properly oriented to understand where a scene is taking place, how it's taking place, where characters are looking, where they are in relation to each other within a setting, you know, or, or good lighting, you know, or not letting the microphones be seen within the shot. I think uh, when we're talking about music, whether we're, you know, and we're coming into this to discuss whether the obje- objectivity exists, um, but as we get into that, uh, it, it carries its own standards, its own things to look for, its own things to attempt to qualify or quantify in its specific art medium. Um, yeah. I mean, hearing you break down the the film medium made me think of how much younger the film media is than music. Like, music, music is even older than, than painting and, like drawing right because people had to had to communicate through sounds before they would they did written word or Mm -hmm. or drew pictures and so it's literally inbuilt in us so i think it's harder to define the parameters of musics because it's so ingrained and natural that like i mean can't think of the name but yeah uh, um that use just using your voice oh that's a song 
There's no instruments. Wait. Yeah. I thought that was a rule. No, it can just be your, your voice, like pentatonics. Yeah. And so and that, that's exactly one of the reasons why uh, today for this discussion, uh, we're just talking about recorded music. That a single performance is a, a completely different beast because we're talking about, you know, on any given night when the Beatles were touring, like they could have a bad night, right? They could have a night where like Ringo drops a stick or, you know, George is sick and can't hit his notes. Um, and so you could say like that wasn't a very good performance, but you're talking about uh, an artist that is almost universally praised. And, you know, even the person who says art is completely subjective, it's, it's just, you know, whether you like it or not, that same person very well might look at you like you're crazy if you say that you don't like the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Wait, you think the Beatles are bad? I'm sorry, what? That that can't be right. <laughs> um, even though music is quote-unquote subjective. Um, but the only way to uh, you know compare the same exact thing over and over again is by looking at recorded music versus you know something that's live. It happens once and then it's over and you can't get it back and you know we want to try to have a a thoughtful discussion presenting the different sides of subjectivity and objectivity in something that's concrete and set in stone as a recorded piece of art rather than the fickle medium of the live performance and the fact that mistakes can be brought into that also we will want to define what we're not talking about and we're not talking about taste we're not talking about how each individual person receives music in their mind because that just varies from individual to individual so much that you can acknowledge that it's bad, but also say it's good uh, that you like it, that sub- that objectively it's bad, but you still enjoy it, and so those aren't necessarily conflicting I- ideas. Yeah, well, I think that uh, starts to get into the different views between music being 100% objective, 0%, or somewhere in between. Uh, So I'll go ahead and introduce uh, the first viewpoint, which is that music is 100% subjective, and that what you just described as taste is all that exists. Mm. That there is no such thing as a bad song. There's not even such thing as a good song. It's all just out there as art to be interpreted on a completely taste opinion subjective level and so it's it's goodness or badness is not set in stone it's relative to the person experiencing it and even in that can change that you can like a song one day and not like the other day oh yeah you can think it's bad when you first hear it and think it's good years later does that theoretical person also think that no song is bad that there are no bad songs to them but no, so well, to them it is the signifier that I think changes that question. That you, someone who thinks music is one hundred percent subjective, mm-hmm. can consistently say like, "I think this song is bad," or "This song is bad to me." This song is bad in my opinion. But that person cannot consistently say, "This song is bad." Period. Okay, uh, That's they a qualifier. They lose themselves okay. from that sort of language. Uh, if they're going to be ideologically consistent. So I'll be presenting the 100% objective view of music in which there are standards. There's clearly chord chord progressions. There are rules throughout music. Not that they can't be broken and still be good if you do it technically proficient. And there are like a, uh, just to take art as a, a metaphor, a a turkey drawing of a kid's hand art is objectively worse than a painting done by almost said Mozart, but that's not a painter. <laughs> Monet. <laughs> Monet. Yes, that's who I was thinking of. Of, of. of a Monet that's that has the technical craftsmanship honed over years and experience driven into it. Not that even simplistic art can be beautiful, that a proficient artist can make a simple work beautiful. It's not in the simplicity or the complexity. It's in the 
proficiency in which they do. So yeah. a fifth grader is not proficient with a crayon and can't color in the lines. Right. And so their artwork is bad. You as the the parent might like it because you have the subjective taste of that's my child and my child made it. Right. Yeah, the comparison of uh, like a kid's drawing to a Monet painting reminds me of it for some reason that just specifically made me think of the guitarist Andy McKee who does just instrumental um, guitar work and he had this song titled drifting that went viral like I don't know 15 years ago and it's just it's an incredible piece uh, both it's it's super enjoyable um, and well composed and memorable uh, just listening to it but then you watch him play it and you're like oh my gosh He's such a talented player. Um, And to say it's almost offensive to the people who are debatably, objectively, so to speak, good at what they do, to say that someone who just learned how to play a G chord yesterday and, you know, it's like they're like, I don't know, 13 and they record on YouTube their first song ever and like no melody, no proficiency at all to say like, okay, well, this is a song. He wrote a song. So it's as good or not good objectively whatever as anything else like that i think from from the position you just presented uh, that music is objective uh i think when, when you when you spell it out with that huge chasm of uh difference in obvious quality obvious measurable prof- me- yeah measurable quality measurable proficiency, measurable like accomplishment of artistic goals. And seemingly, while this is getting to the the harder to measure side, seemingly, um, you know, better experiences, better um, connections with listeners. Um, When you give it that wide of a chasm, I think it's easier to see, even if you don't agree that music is objective, like, oh, I see that. It's really hard to say that the one is not better than the other when you present that wide of a chasm, when you put the, the turkey hand next to the Monet. I have a turkey hand. Yeah. Don't be hating on my turkey. <laughs> <laughs> the last uh, position, uh, before we jump into our usual discussion where one of us will just take uh, sides, is being somewhere in the middle. But I think... In the middle can be done both consistently and inconsistently. I think that you can say that music is kind of subjective, kind of objective, or you can live as if that's true without admitting it um, and be inconsistent how you deal with it. To say like, oh, I think this song is awful on the one hand, but then in a cooler conversation say that it, it just matters what your opinion is. Or like I kind of used as an example earlier, to be the person who says, you know, your opinion is all that matters, you know, your taste is all that matters, but then give you the stink eye for disliking the Beatles or Led Zeppelin or, you know, Nirvana or whoever, you know, these uh, whoever more acclaimed historical labeled the goat, the important artists, the greatest of all time. Yes. Um, How dare you? <laughs> yeah. So. I think there's a lot of space in the middle of the two poles that we presented. Um, And it's a, it's a dangerous space to try to be consistent. And I honestly think that in the ways that we think, in the ways that we talk, in the ways that we deal with one another, most of us practice in the middle. Even if we have a, you know, philosophical stance that's at one of the poles, I think, uh, just if you talk about the way people, or if you look at the way people talk, or look at the way people review music, the way that people tweet about music, mm-hmm. the way that people recommend music that they really love, we end up being somewhere in the middle. We we can't get away from making objective sounding statements like "Oh man, this is great," or "Kendrick Lamar is the goat," <laughs> you know, <laughs> or whatever else it is that um, are you know subjective statements or subjective thoughts being made in objective terms. Yes. Uh, 
So yeah, because nuance is is the internet. It's like a filter for nuance. Yeah, it's nuance all gone. died in '96. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to read your thousand word blog about the nuance of your thoughts. They're Aww. only going to read that, that 50 word tweet. Um, so for our first discussion, I will be taking the position, the position of 100% subjectivity and asking Ethan to discuss with me from the position of objectivity. You up for the challenge? We'll see. We'll see yeah. where it goes. We might switch at some point. Okay. Just for the fun of it. Because... That's what this podcast is for, right? Uh, allowing these discussions to take place with people who disagree, even if we're just faking it. The benefit of faking it, so to speak, is learning the other side and empathizing with the other side. Yeah. So that's what I think makes this practice so healthy. Um, so on the side of subjectivity. Why is Kendrick Lamar not the goat, Chase? Why is he only the goat in your heart? Uh, because the people who think he is the goat are just people that thinks his music sound good. His mm -hmm. music sounds good. Um, that there are plenty of people that dislike Kendrick Lamar, and yet they like music, or they might even like hip hop, and really not like Kendrick. I know of people that like some hip hop and not Kendrick. So how can he be the greatest of all time if it's not agreed upon? Hmm. Because the experts in that field who know the technicalities, the, the flows, the, the arrangements, the, the lyrical depth that they have set the standards throughout the years of what is hip hop, what is rap. And to them, they see that he meets a lot of those criteria. How do you become an expert in music? Usually by playing it. Okay. So if you look at those experts, you won't be able to get away from simplifying everything down to its core and saying that they think Kendrick's, Kendrick's music sounds better than other rappers. That they personally are just more pleased by his music mm -hmm. than the other options so what if the majority is personally pleased the overwhelming majority is personally pleased by his music the that like we live in a democracy we okay. vote and sure. we say uh, this is the pinnacle of art if not only at this time that we we, the people, have decided, based on the standards of rap and hip-hop, that we are elevating him to the top. So, Well, that hasn't happened. There, I don't think anyone <laughs> even has agreed standards of what is good hip-hop. Are um, there agreed standards on what is good music? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I think the only standard is the one that you carry around with you because legitimately, like, I, for, I love this example. Punk rock was essentially created by people that didn't know how to play music. Mm -hmm. It became one of the most powerful um, and popular uh, versions of rock music to have ever existed and was literally created by teenagers who had just picked up their instruments, mm -hmm. learned mm -hmm. two chords, one beat on the drums, and they had something to say and they went and said it. And the uh, the message was almost benefited by their lack of technical proficiency um, and their lack of melodic know-how, so to speak. And it created something that did accomplish its purpose and connect with listeners, uh, not only you know, despite uh, the so-called qualities of good music that you might present to me from your position, um, it was almost it was but it was almost benefited by the lack of what certainly people at the time would have called uh good music mm -hmm. you know i think probably some of the first people to hear punk music were probably appalled at it you know when that style of playing first showed up on the scene i would imagine that the experts of the day um thought it was trash uh and then look at us now 
you know we uh almost every rock band today has some punk rock band uh Influence. listed as like one of their major influences yeah yeah and you know we even have like just new versions of punk rock out there so so it's interesting you mentioned uh music that any music so so i just sung a song and i'm about to use it to make a point and it's going to be recorded and so we're talking about recorded music so now what is music did i just record music and if so was it good or bad and is this whole podcast just one song and then if it if it is what category of song is it in sure i i assume what you're saying is that the four notes you just sang um i didn't count are absolutely not as good as um you know a symphony orchestra playing beethoven's the fifth sure or or, or pentatonics whose voices are angel angelic yeah. and uh, at least slightly better than yours <laughs> a yeah. little bit just uh, okay um we'll, we'll say there and i still think someone could listen to your four notes mm-hmm. and say oh that was nice right and that kind of makes it like I mean, there are cds with tracks on there that are only a few seconds long mm. um you know there's there there are no rules that say a song needs to have words the song needs to have a beat or instruments. A song needs to be a certain length. Um, and there's even like noise music. There's atonal music out there. Um, so is white noise considered music? I, if someone's not playing it or performing it, uh, I would say no. But okay. I also have heard white noise used very effectively in, in the context of songs. Right. Okay. Um, I've heard silence. That's what I was about to ask. We're, we're getting down to yeah, the, the yeah. bare minimum. Like. One of my favorite albums of all time on a completely subjective level, an album that I happen to know plenty of people hate is, uh, the earth sings me for me by a band, uh, a defunct band called the receiving end of sirens. And they intentionally used silence as an instrument on the album. There's one song that basically goes to silence for like 20 seconds. And it's incredible. Like for me, in my own personal experience with the album, it it's a magical moment of nothing. Hmm. And be that as it may, I, I, I think you know, no matter what uh, someone says to try to convince me of how good a song is, if I listen to it and don't like it, it doesn't please my ears. Hmm. You know, I just don't think you can tell me that I'm wrong. You look stumped. That's pretty good. You know what's funny is I don't. I'm I'm you honestly not it. arguing from my perspective. I'm just. I don't know if y'all can tell, but Chase is much more into music than me, and proficient in this making, topic might have been my idea. It's pretty pretty clear that he's very good at talking about this. And Do you want to switch sides? No. Uh, we're agreeing right here that objectively there is bad music that it has been proven that there are technical skills that you can learn to get objectively better over time or when you cuz you're starting out worse so is yeah what you're saying is if i don't like a good song i am wrong yes yes you are wrong to like that not like that good song you are of poor taste Poor taste. Ah, poor taste. Okay. So according to my poor taste, I think um, everything you just said about uh, technical proficiency Mm -hmm. is baloney and boo hockey. I have personally seen artists, uh, at least to my opinion, making music that is less engaging, less effective, less connecting to me as they grow in technical proficiency that there might be becoming better singers or um, faster guitar players or able to play more complex drum beats but that doesn't lead to them writing better songs um, and so that leaves me as a fan subjectively preferring their older music in spite of 
everything that they are doing as musicians theoretically making them better musicians. How do you know they're better singers? I think that's best seen in the live setting where you can tell that uh, they're hitting their like notes better or mm. more frequently that, you know, see an artist in 2005 and, you know, they're like losing their voice or they, they change a song so that they don't have to sing a, the high note that was originally written for but it. We're, but we're or they're just really pitchy. Music. Yeah. Well, I, th- yeah, but in recorded music, it's almost all perfected. You know, very rarely are you hearing the actual performance from a singer. Um, you're often hearing uh, something that's been tuned and corrected. Mm-hmm. So in terms of uh, a vocalist improving, what I was saying is the improvements are easier to... But their improvements are objective. Sure. Sure. No, I, I was agreeing with you on that. Yeah. I think uh, it's hogwash to say that... Um, you can't get better at playing guitar. Mm -hmm. I know as a fact that I'm a better drummer now than I was in seventh grade when my parents got me a little kid sized set. Um, But what I think is equally hogwash is the idea that uh, the person who is now a better um, drummer Mm -hmm. therefore makes better music therefore writes better songs. I don't think that's a one-to-one. I, mm. uh, s- I, I think that is where the, the, the differences between musicianship and art. But those technical proficiencies are what I'm saying makes a song better. Those complexities, they can make a song more interesting, which some people think, most people think, is more better. more better more better that's mm, that's awesome but those those improvements from your your one snare um boom boom beat on by the fifth grader or fifth grader sure uh that it is objective to everybody that because that 50 year old drummer from metallica can play a better drum solo that is better music if that song was just that drum solo because we're getting fluid with the what a song is song is just drums mm-hmm. that that kid cannot play a better song than that drummer nobody would ever make that point okay i still think the the kid who just picked up drumsticks and is playing the most simple beat of all time, mm. dun ka dun ka, there's four on the floor, um, can have an, an incredibly beautiful moving song on top of this extremely simple drum beat that he just learned. Meanwhile, I can go to the next room and hear something that I personally think is terrible from a really great drummer who's so great that he's being distracting and doing things unbefitting of the other instruments trying to play Mm. a song and that the technical proficiency can get in the way of anything that's emotionally moving. And that could be totally right. That is totally 100% possible. But you're moving the goalposts by adding in all the other instruments. We're saying a song with the same instrument. But a song isn't just a drummer. No, no, no. We just said song could be silence. So now are we backing off of that, that there is silence? That's a, a song could be silence. A well, song could be... Yeah, I just hummed a song. Sure. You, each each song would need to be judged on the merits of what's present. I wouldn't say that a five-minute track of silence counts as a song because there's nothing in there that is musical. Uh, I think mute. Music still suggests melody of some sort. That's how, you know, we made a joke at the very beginning of recording, probably not still in this episode, but oh, you could have of us so mean. Uh, talking versus singing. Mm-hmm. You know the difference, right? So, there, 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 so there's, there's an a objective, clear, So there's an objective difference. There's an objective 
difference between the definition of singing and the definition of talking. Mm -hmm. That's still not getting into an objective difference between good singing and bad singing or uh, good songwriting and bad songwriting. So what I'm saying is, even though uh, you know a song can use silence, so you still you need to judge each song based on what's present. It's not very often that you're going to find a song that's just drums and nothing but drums. Most likely, you are going to be talking about music that is at least one vocal and at least one instrument. Um, and you you judge it based on everything present, which right is it, it again comes down to taste. Yes, yes. Do I like this? Yeah. Do you, you know like it? Yeah. that uh, whether you're talking about you know a four year old who's mm-hmm. beginning to put together their thoughts on the world for the first time, and a forty year old who um, got a you know a PhD. Of some sort in music and PhD in drumming, yeah, and you know plays out bars on the weekend and teaches at a college during mm-hmm. the week, uh, and has students on the side. Uh, that both of them have their own valid experiences, their own valid tastes, and literally for both sides of the spectrum um, of experienced to inexperienced what you might call an expert it still comes down to um point blank does this sound good to me Mm -hmm. do i enjoy this um and when you get to that the meaningfulness of you know a a youtube reviewer or a five-star review on a on a website or a <laughs> an social media influencer uh, saying that something is good. Uh, it's not about them being correct. It's about you caring about their opinion. It's about you having some reason to appreciate their taste. Um, it's not about objectivity at all. I think the <laughs> the only way for your claim of objectivity to be provable and unfalsifiable would be to find a song that literally every single person in the world agrees is not good. Um, Look at this photograph. Oh, sorry. Then yeah, I, I bet I bet Nickelback thinks that's a I good song. I bet they think it's a good song. Yeah, yeah you're right. I yeah. bet their parents are big fans of it. Um, and you like that was a hit. Like you know, there are people there that are like that song, okay. right? Um, <laughs> they wrote them a nice check. There might really be more like people it. that enjoy making fun of that song, but there's still plenty of people who like that song. Yes. Um, and so the 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 wildness of the claim to think that I can prove that the song is bad by asking every single person in existence. Mm-hmm. I'll and say y- it again. So subjectively, Hogwash. can you prove songs are better? Um, only in my opinion. Only in your opinion, yeah. Yeah. But so- in your opinion, I want to try to hit this note again. In your opinion, uh, in, it, in everybody's opinion, there yeah. are bad songs and there are good songs. In their opinion. Yes. Uh, everyone thinks that there are songs that sound good and songs that sound bad. Songs that I want to hear and songs that I don't want to hear. According to their own standards. It's not even necessarily a standard. Um, you you might be able to weasel out some standards from, you know, a few people, but I, it's so subjective and so feeling based that I don't think it's um, measurable standards for most people. So you drew you drew lines earlier that there are objectively a differences between songs and talking, but what if I call talking a song? Like, there's a whole talking uh, song on an album that has a bunch of uh, sure. credible songs that yeah that are universally, like, good songs or universally yeah. sung. And um, then there's a, a talking interlude or something. Yeah, well, I think that that is leading us into um, a different discussion about what is music mm-hmm. and how is it defined 
but in most instances, if like you you would recognize that as being other, you even just refer to it as an interlude. Mm-hmm. Like you're if you're looking at a track on an album that's actually just someone talking, um, it seems pretty clear that. Like, that's not a quote-unquote song that this artist is going to play live. That this artist probably views that as something like a quote-unquote interlude Mm. and not a song that they wrote, not a musical composition. So why do songs get popular? Oh, man. Uh, Because enough people find it pleasing to their ears. Of course, there's there's a way different argument about... or And there's there's so much more there about uh, budget exposure um the things yeah. that uh disc jockeys want to play the things that spotify picks up for the playlists the songs and artists that have enough uh label money behind them to push them but if humans are so different in that in all of their subjective sure realities then why do we agree that there are like why there's masses of people that agree that these popular artists should be we should go to their concerts. I've seen stadiums full of people at Justin Bieber concerts. Right. And they're um, so the subjective are all based on objective hearing and objective thought waves that are similar between each human being. So each human being, we all share these similar ways of hearing and thought processes and neurons firing. That that are either pleasing or not pleasing. If if your idea that everything is subjective, then there would be almost no popular artists. There might be kind of plurality, like maybe minor majorities, but it would be so fractured that there would be no quote unquote big name artists because it's hundred percent subjective, and everybody lives their own experience. And um, no. I think there is enough um, shared experience, enough group think, enough enough hive mind, um, and enough uh, areas of exposure um, that are common to cultures uh, to create the circumstances necessary uh, to allow for the popularity of songs that even people of your position might say are bad you know it's it's a very common critique to say that you know popular music isn't very good or that the hits um don't represent good music well Mm -hmm. or even that a single is like the worst song on that artist's album these are all extremely common things Mm -hmm. uh for people to say and it it almost is a, a self like disproving point it's it's nearly self contradictory because if if objectivity did exist within art, I think more people would be tapping into it. Um, I if like so if the, so the many people chords. if so many people like a song, why isn't it good? You know, is someone who just believes in objectivity within music just trying to pat themselves on the back for being the one person who doesn't like an insanely popular song? <laughs> I got nothing. I got. I'm. I'm out. I'm out of my thing. I don't. I don't so, think. I think it's pretty so. obvious. These hundred percent objective and hundred percent objective. They can't find a middle ground because they're not operating from a same uh, presuppositional right. foundation. Um, so as, as is often the case, um, I think more people live in the middle than they do on these poles. But sometimes they do. Like I, there, I think there are people on both of these poles. Um, What I think we just experienced in that discussion is that the side I took is much easier to argue from. Mm -hmm. Um, And the side that you are arguing from is really hard to discuss. because One, it's offensive. You have to tell someone that they're they're wrong. wrong. Uh, Two, it's really hard to define. And I, I want to present a model of thinking that actually helps in this regard. Um, I, I pull this from an old philosopher named David Hume. He, he wrote an essay that I found to be extremely um, memorable and helpful in this regard. 
uh, called On uh, Taste and Judgment. So in our discussion, we, d- we spoke a lot about taste and the idea of like, this is your opinion, this is my opinion, this is what pleases you, this is what pleases me. Cool. That's all fine and dandy. We have our opinions, we have our own experiences, um, and even those can change. Blah. Um, so what he suggests is that like we shouldn't think of taste as being good or bad. Taste is just what it is. But we should have a separate category for judgment. And this is the category where things are both subjective and objective. However, you are always tapped into your taste, your personal preferences, your subjectivity, and no one has um, perfect objectivity. So he presents uh, judgment as something that is actually an impossibility, which I think you would recognize from the discussion as it being wildly difficult to to like land the plane on this ghostly idea of this is what good music is mm-hmm. like like even in our research for this episode trying to land at a definition of good music is blank was really hard to find and you know we saw people trying out and ultimately kind of like debunking different ideas of what what makes music good or not whether it's uh the effectiveness of its emotional landing on people or if it's technical proficiency um or its originality or its uh complexity i i liked the the guy who made a case for moral good or bad because saying good or bad is is can be a moral judgment. Yeah, but even then, I think like the what's odd about judging music morally is that at this point you're just talking about like the position of the lyrics mm-hmm. and um, not the art itself. Which lyrics aren't part of the art? Um, I think the the idea of whether the moral of the lyrics is good or bad is separate from the art. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, so as David Hume presents it, judgment is something that is impossible, but not 100% impossible. Um, you know, like it's, it's impossible to know all of math, (laughs) but it is possible to learn more math. Yes. Right. So, you know, it's impossible to know, um, like what we used, you know, the Monet example earlier, Mm -hmm. it's impossible to know all of painting and to know everything in the universe that makes painting good or bad. You know, at once upon a time, Picasso's painting was considered bad. Um, But you can grow in that medium. And the more you learn, the more you study, the more you experience, uh, the uh, higher the opportunity of you increasing in your judgment, Um, which... I think a, a very simple example is if you put the same poem in front of a college professor of poetry and in front of a second grader, um, you know, if the professor says it's bad and the second grader says it's good, um, which one of their opinions is more valid? Um, you know, if you are on the 100% subjective side, you have to say both of their opinions are completely as valid. Uh, the poem has no uh, quality on its own. Um, and it just matters about whether the person likes it or not. Um, so similarly, I think if, if you're talking about like the, the music producer, the music instructor, the, the, the critic, the fan, um, the more music they hear... Uh, the more that they learn, uh, the more that they study and research and experience, the more judgment that they can have. Um, but that doesn't mean that their judgment suddenly becomes true. That doesn't mean that their judgment becomes correct. 
but I think it be- means that their judgment becomes more uh, has a higher possibility more of being weight. correct. It has more weight to it. Thank you. Um, and that's when you lead to situations that I think probably most of us have said or most of us have thought. At least, you know, all of us have heard other people say um, statements like, "Oh, this song's good. I just don't enjoy it." I've hundred percent said that. Right. King or Scholastic. or the opposite. Right. Like, I don't think the song's good at all, but I love it. Um, you know, we, we have our guilty pleasures. Oh, right? guilty pleasure. Yeah. Um, it's a great reflection of the so, understanding of, right. So David Hume, I believe he's an atheist, but yes. I think, um, bringing in a, like a deity for that analogy works is helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, so like if judgment is something that we can't ever perfectly have, you know, present the situation of like, if there's a God, um, does he get to have a judgment on our art, right? So if if a creator being over existence says, this song's good, this song's bad, this song's better, this is the greatest song of all time. Um, it's the best song ever. Yeah. So I think like that, that theoretical situation would be the kind of the end all be all mm-hmm. of yeah here's the objective standard but we are always just reaching and grasping for that and i think rather than us saying yeah this is the objective truth we can present our cases and have discussions about it with a uh, hu- uh, hu- hum- humility that we might be right we might be wrong um without having to throw all objectivity out the window. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, uh, yeah. The, the idea of God in music, I think can be also seen as there is a perfect song. It's everybody thinks it's possible, but it's an abstract. Nobody's ever going to write the perfect song, but it, it exists as a standard almost yeah. to be That's measured. Funny against the uh the band i mentioned earlier uh, actually while recording the album i mentioned earlier the earth sings me for me um the method the band used kind of on a on a mental more philosophical level of trying to write the album uh they they, they imagined that the song pieces already existed in the universe and they were just trying to put them together in the way that they were meant to be. Hmm. Um, which, like, I love that, like what you just said. It's almost like every time someone attempts to write a song, that's what they're going for. You know, that's if they're actually putting any artistic attempts into it, if they aren't, you know, like I was joking earlier, trying to write bad songs. Yeah. You know, if they aren't just mechanically... Um, putting formulas together to crank out a hit. If they're actually trying to create art that is musical and expresses something honest within them, you know, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to write the perfect song. And you just stop at the point where you say, I'm satisfied because reaching that perfection is impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, it'll drive us crazy if we try. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I, I love that. Like, it's. I, I feel like I even experienced it like this morning. The idea of like just like picking up my guitar, writing something off the top of my head, and then suddenly being like, oh, I think this actually goes, oh, in this song. Oh, let me try that. Oh, cool. Oh, what about this? What about this? Kind of like letting the pieces fall into place. Uh, there is something, um, there is something kind of a- esoteric to it, kind of otherworldly. That is like it, it's hard to put standards to. It really is hard to say like this makes it good, this makes it bad, um, and you know it hurts to say like or to hear it said like this isn't a good song, man. Uh, you know I've had that addressed to me. It's fine. Um, everything's fine. Um, I'm fine. Stop asking. I'm fine. Right. But then it's also funny like one song that you know a handful of people have told me like, isn't good. 
has also connected with a few people. And again, that's not to say that that person's, you know, has poor taste. They might actually have poor judgment, but uh, that's still just art doing what art does. And I think another interesting discussion on this would be that what's the purpose of this, of music? And when you get to the purpose of music, um, whether it is quote unquote good or bad, might not really matter. But the music that is potentially, arguably good, might be the music that's better at accomplishing those purposes. Um, I I heard a a model presented to me recently um, that was like, if half of art is the artistic expression of simply creating the art of getting the song written, engineered, produced, mixed, mastered from your first artistic idea down to the finished MP3 that's streaming on Spotify. Then the second half of it is the connection. The second half of like, how does this land on people? Does it affect people? Does it move people? What's Does it please people? Of that the experience, song? right? So, if you look at it as like the full circle of both sides, from the side of the creator and the side of the consumer, um, if if both consumer and creator can say, um, "Job well done," you know that I made the song that I wanted to make, mm-hmm. and the consumer can say, I enjoyed this song. This song moved me. This song means something to me. Um, if you have that on both sides, then I think you have what you need to call it a good song on some level. And I think there's some sense to which that's objective, even though a lot of subjectivity is going into it. Mm. Yep. It's definitely a mix. Right. To me, it it doesn't quite matter. It matters in the fact of how music should be disseminated about objectivity, like mm-hmm. how how we should communicate, hey, this is a good song. Try it out and see if you like it. Mm-hmm. I think should be more the conversation uh, in that we should promote good songs. And if people don't like it, that's fine. They don't, they aren't, they won't get popular, but we still acknowledge the, the effort and, artistry that went into those good songs and at least give them the good label yeah to f- recognize those artists so to that extent i think we can move into our, our last um portion which is uh why can't we be friends <laughs> so someone who really does believe in the objectivity of art mm-hmm. and that there there are good songs there are bad songs um you know, how can they be friends with people who disagree? Like what, what would be the, the obstacle to get over to have a healthy friendship with someone who's full subjectivity? Building that idea of taste Mm -hmm. of that on paper, the song's objectively good. Most people acknowledge it's objectively good, but that taste is so affected by experience and, uh, location growth, uh, Biolo- biology, ear ear drum uh, sizes that uh, objectively good songs can be heard by somebody's taste who taste is a hundred percent subjective and be seen as I don't enjoy that. Right. Yeah. Let taste be subjective without yeah any arguments. Like say. Allowing the allowing for the categorical distinctions, mm-hmm. such that you don't begin accusing people of Happy. poor taste or assuming yes. that you have better taste. It's letting taste be taste. Mm-hmm. You know, I I, uh, I get crap for not liking peanut butter. I literally can't choose any differently. I just offered it's, you peanut butter. Yeah, you They're did. Good peanut butter crackers. Yeah, it's objectively like, it's good. not my decision. It legitimately is nothing I can do about it unless I force feed myself enough with the chance that my tongue will eventually adapt or change its mind. <laughs> but and as for now, like it, it's out of my hands. And I think we should 
allow that space um, in other people's enjoyments of music to let them have taste that's up to them and we don't have to argue about it Mm -hmm. give them a hard time um and i I, you know what i mentioned earlier as well just humility you know if 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 you want to have a discussion about the goodness of something or the badness of something um you know do it with kindness with understanding with um a an open willingness to the uh possibility of you not being correct uh, which again i think is where uh hume's model comes in very handy that your judgment cannot ever be perfect uh you will not be the standard of what the proper judgment is mm-hmm. so chase how can the hundred percent subjective artist give an olive branch to the objective ob- observer yeah uh ask be willing to learn from them be willing to hear their arguments um you know, someone who does think music is objective is probably going to be coming to the table with a lot of observa- observations that are a lot um, deeper than, uh, oh, I like the beat. Like, oh, it's catchy. Oh, it sounds good. Um, which, you know, is like the the <laughs> the things I heard a lot from like my parents growing up. Like that's how they described the music that they liked. Mm-hmm. And those are like fairly shallow observations, which is fine. And those are completely valid reasons for, again, like liking a song and having the taste that you do. But if someone is saying like, you know, objectively, this is good. Mm-hmm. Be like, okay, why? Tell me. Yeah. Um, Instead of beating the drum, which I, I, it gets, it gets under my skin a little bit, just yeah. constantly saying, Oh, Art is subjective. Art right. is subjective. Yeah. We all agree that there is a subjectivity. We're, we're, we're trying to be, level that playing foon. Let's move beyond that and explore something more than that. Yeah. Like, I, I actually have a list of least favorite songs. Um, songs that I probably would argue are bad because I hate them so much. Which, and the fact that like, there's obviously something personal going on here. Um, <laughs> I got a vendetta against sounds, these songs. That sounds subjective. <laughs> um but one of them is uh, Big Girls Don't Cry by Fergie. Uh, and I have a friend who actually like really loves that song and will like sometimes like play it, sing it when he has a guitar in his hands. But he actually has like a deeply personal reason for liking the song um, that goes back to like a family member and a, and a, and a relationship with uh, said family member. So like a completely valid personal reason for having affection for the song that I happen to despise. Um, so again, it's like kind of giving out the olive branch, like let yeah. him love the song. I don't need to pass along my hatred for it. He doesn't need to hate the song as much as I do. Um, I agree. Well, thanks chase. Yeah. Thank you, Ethan. I feel mm-hmm. I've unlearned a lot of ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've ranted a lot, um, but we knew that would happen with this topic. Well, uh, I think, you you will always be the more useful person here on the <laughs> months when we're getting into more political leaning issues. Thank you for listening to this month's episode, but the conversation isn't over yet. We want to hear from you. What did we get right or wrong, and what's your perspective on the issue? By writing in, your feedback can be featured in the response episode we will publish later this month. Email us at unlearningignorance at gmail.com. Tweet us at unignorancepod or leave a voicemail at 972-885-9574. Again, that's 972-885-9574. And by lending your voice to the conversation, you can help this podcast represent the Vox Populi, the voice of the people. Thanks for tuning in to Unlearning Ignorance, and we'll be back next month with another divisively divisive issue.